This is Vic Slain Hope, and you're tuning in to Dusty Vision TV. Just give me a little bit of peace, a steady job and some food to eat. Just give me a little bit of peace, a steady job and some food to eat. Bronx is definitely in the building tonight. Really Just looking forward to chatting with this dude. I came across his channel not too long ago. And I'm going to be the first, one of the first to call it if someone hasn't called it already, this dude's going to be next up. Um, really interesting channel, and I really encourage everyone out there to subscribe to it. It's Vic Slang Hope on YouTube. Ladies and gentlemen, I have Victor. What up, man? What's good? What's good? I appreciate you having me on the show. Yeah, yeah. I appreciate the, the great content that you're, you're putting out there, man. Um, really, really a, a different type of vibe than a lot of the other, um, you know, gang-related type you know, a channels that I see out there. So I appreciate you bringing some good stuff. Yeah, definitely. You know, try to do something like different, yeah. not glorify, but like, you know, just bring awareness. Man, I, I saw a couple videos today that I want to get into specifically, but before we do that, um, tell us what made you start your channel. So I'm a person that like, I like learning and I love educating myself and I like whether it's reading and watching documentaries, so at a point in my life, I was I started to watch a lot of like documentaries on YouTube and stuff like that. So, and then I thought about it like all the other ignorant content that existed on YouTube and like other social media platforms, right? So I was like, I started looking at like the views and stuff like that. I started looking at like how many views like some of the ignorant content gets and how many views like the educational stuff get. Oh, and it doesn't it's like night and, and day. It does, yeah, and it doesn't even compare. So. Mm -hmm. I thought, of, and then I just told myself, like, like I used to do, um, like public speaking engagements, and I used to serve on panels at universities, and so and stuff like that. While you know, before the the virus and stuff happened, so then I told myself, like, I could start, I should start a YouTube channel. Like, I could start that. talk about like. At first, I wanted to talk about controversial topics that a lot of people is not really like talking about or they scared to expound on. But then I was just like, you know, I could just kind of like put my message out there on the platform and then, you know, millions of people could one day perhaps see it on YouTube and it's something that will kind of like last. So that's kind of like w where I was trying to go. I love that. So you made, made a positive out of a negative and you're, you know, probably like the fifth or sixth person I've talked to who has a successful, and I'm going to say successful YouTube channel because it is hard to get 10,000 subscribers and you're only growing. But for anybody out there who knows or doesn't know about YouTube, it is really hard to get 10,000 subscribers. I have 24,000 right now and it took me forever just to get to 1,000. Um, so the fact that you took a negative, the pandemic, the coronavirus and turned it into a positive, which is a successful YouTube channel, I definitely got to tip my, my hat to you, dog. Definitely, definitely. Thank you. <laughs> Well, let's, uh, let's, let's take it all the way back, man, for people who don't know you. And for once again, I encourage everybody out there to YouTube Vic Slang Hope. That's V-I-C-S-L-A-N-G-H-O-P-E for my remedial people out there. Um, where did you grow up, man? So I grew up in the Bronx. I was born and raised here all my life. I moved around a few times. You know, it was, it was kind of like rough growing up, you know, in the shelter system. Um, I had... I was out in Honduras, so like my mother believed heavily on like co like culture and like family ties. So I always go to Honduras frequently. And once the last time I went, I stayed over there for like two years. So back over here, my mother was living her life like you know, like a single woman without her child around. So when I came back, she was staying in the room. But you know, when I came back, it was a different situation. Like we couldn't stay in the room. So. You know, she was trying to figure out how to get an apartment, and that was kind of, like, hard. And then, like, we ended up going into a shelter. And, yeah, so I grew up in the Bronx most of my life. I grew up, like, around, like, 174th area. I'm, mm. um, like, like around 174th, Bryant, for those of y'all who know. This is before they built the mall over there. And I went to CS6, which is on Vice and Tremont. And then around, like, 12 years old, I kind of like moved uptown to the Bronx for the, you know, for the viewers uh, or whoever's watching it. Like I moved, I moved to uptown of the Bronx, but then I was only there for like maybe like four years and then I got incarcerated and then I, I, re I got incarcerated at 18 and then I returned home like 24 or 25. So I wasn't even out there a lot, like a long time. Like, you know, I just, but that was the first place that I, I actually could call home. Like, you know, uh, Now, to, um, 
for the layman's out there who don't really know, you know, we obviously know South Bronx, South, South Bronx. And um, yeah. I have a homie from um, from North Bronx. Uh, shout out to Preacher Bishop. Um, where, I guess, where, for lack of better wor- phrase, where did you grow up in the Bronx? Like, South Side, North Side, what are we talking? Yeah, so, orig- like, so till I, till, like, I was 12, I grew up in the South Bronx. And after 12, I moved to the Northeast Bronx, which is, like, uptown. Gotcha. Okay, cool, cool. And when was the first time, I want to get before you even jumped off the porch and all that, but when was the first time you even heard anything about Crips and Bloods, you personally? So, oh, ooh, man, you, you, you got me going in the brain. I'm, <laughs> I'm thinking, like, so I think I was young. I, I don't remember exactly when, but I know, like, before, like, um, so before, so I was into sports a lot when I was growing up. So I didn't really, you know, know about gangs and stuff like that. So like, maybe to like, I be, when I came back from Honduras, which is like around, I was like around 10 when I came back from Honduras. So around 10, 11. So when I came back from Honduras, um, some of my cousins, they was already banging. And for those who know, like a lot of like Honduran people, they actually were crip back then. So... They even had like they they own little situation called Honduran Mafia Crip. So, you know, a lot of Hondurians were Crip. So when I came back, I started seeing that there was a lot of like Hondurians that were Crip. And this is like the first time I actually like fully got exposed to it because I didn't grow up in a household where like, you know, we watched Snoop Dogg or we watched like mainstream media and stuff like that. And if we did, like, you know, my family was, you know, they spoke Spanish. You know, they watched novellas and soap operas and all these different things. So, I didn't grow up in a household where I was exposed to that kind of like that, but I still went to school. But my first time, like really, really getting into it was like when I came back from Honduras, I was like around 10, 11. And I just became intrigued with it. And I think it was more so because people, and this is like the people I grew up around. So it, it, it almost seems like it became like a cultural thing. So okay. this is kind of like my first time, like getting in tune with it. Okay, so the first time was, you know, I learned that from your channel, too. I had no idea that there was a, you know, a big population at the beginning of um, Honduran Crips. Yeah, definitely. Um, The Bronx actually has, it's not the biggest um, Honduran community, um, like, from because a lot of Honduran communities have been spread out throughout the United States and other countries, or the Garifuna community, um, because we were called Garifuna, um, the ones that still have that culture and speak the language. Um, predominantly the black Hondurians in, in Honduras and, and Guatemala and Nicaragua and in different parts because we are spread out. So the Garifuna people, the Hondurian folks, we at the Bronx is actually one of like the biggest communities. This is Vic Slain Hope and you're tuning in to Dusty Vision TV. Just give me a little bit of peace. Steady job is some food to eat. Just give me a little bit of peace. Steady job is some food to eat. Just How old were you when you first quote unquote jumped off the porch? So when I was young. <laughs> So when I became, so when I, when we moved, so before when we was in the shelter, like I had to be around with my mom, I had to be around my mother often because, you know, like when, when we left the shelter, I had to leave with her. When I go back, I had to kind of like go with her. So it's like, I was around my mother a lot. So I couldn't really have, plus I was still young. So when I first moved to the Northeast Bronx uptown, this is like the first time where like, I have like a, you know, a home since coming back from Honduras. So I got a home. So now, like, I'm able to be away from my mother. I don't have to go everywhere with her. So I started to, like, so when I started hanging out with my cousins playing soccer, we used to, like, after soccer games, we used to go hang out. And, you know, get into, like, whatever we get into, chill. But around this time is when I'm starting to realize, like, every time I hung out with my cousins, like, they was always getting into stuff because they was gangbanging. So, have like, it'll never be like a regular situation. Like we'll leave a soccer game. We'll go to go get some food or something. And it's like, they will see a rival or they will see somebody. And I'm just standing there. Right. Like usually I used to be the guy that they used to just tell me to hold their stuff. <laughs> so they'll be like, you hold my bag. you hold this, hold that. And, and I'm just there watching, you know, like, like what the hell is going on? So, um, <laughs> so around like 12, I started to like go out and then I started to like sneak out the house, but I would go hang out with my cousins. 
So, and then, you know, we would go out late nights and they would like, you know, go ride out or go about their business and stuff like that. And I would just be around. But this is like, this is like the beginning of me, like starting to hang out with like people that was a little older than me. And so this was like 12. And then like I, when I turned 16 was like the first time. And it's funny because when I went to middle school and some of my friends will tell you when I went to middle school, I just, you know, I was like a, almost like a fake crip, <laughs> you know, like, but I, so I kind of like, like I said, it, it felt like it was a cultural thing. A lot of my family, like, I, like cousins. And and by the way, a lot of them, this is like a sound note. A lot of Hondurians, like Garifunas usually tend to be related. Hmm. So, um, some way, somehow, like, because when we was exiled from St. Vincent or whatever, we was like a small population and you know, you know how it goes. So small population becomes big and it was just like a lot of mingling. So a lot of us tend to be family. So it was like a family tie type of thing. It wasn't really like looked at as some game banging stuff. It was more like a, a family thing. And, but that's just our like aspect of it. But then like, so when I was going to middle school, sometimes I would, I would wear like a, a blue bandana. Um, like if I had a, you know, but it wasn't really nothing crazy. I was, I was still kind of like hiding because I wasn't crip and I didn't want to get into nothing with people, you know, but you know, it was kind of like here and there. And some of my friends would tell you, but like when I became 16, I really started hanging out more frequently with them going out to like, you know, back then clubs used to be like, you could go, you could, you, you only had to be 19 to party and 21 to drink or 18 to party, 18 to party, 21 to drink. So back then they were a little more lenient with laying you into certain spots. Like you could just say, I used to say, I forgot my ID. I'm not going to drink though. And you know, the bouncers would be a little cool back then. So when I turned 16, it's when I really started to like hang out and really start things. But this is in the South Bronx. Mind you, I lived, the, I lived in the North Bronx, but most of my people, most of the Hondurians live in the South Bronx. So, and the South Bronx is, is kind of totally different than the Northeast Bronx. Even though in the Northeast Bronx, it's, 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 it's a little more houses, more residential area. It's not a lot of housing projects. But it's, it's just like in a little kind of like more discreet, kind of like wild way. But in the South Bronx, it's just like out in the open. It's not a lot of like cut blocks like in the Northeast Bronx. So it, it was a little different. Mm. Okay. Now you have a video titled How and Why I Turned Crip. And part of that is because the from what I understood from the video, the Bloods were, you know, being terrorists and kind of, you know, oppressing the people. And, and, and talk to me about, you know, that whole uh, situation to, to why you turn Crip. Yeah. So, so like, I, so I mentioned just briefly um, how, you know, I was hanging out with them, but even though I was hanging out with them, like, it's almost like sometimes some of the people that used to hang out with us, they used to just feel like they was automatically down because like I said, like a lot of us are cousins. A lot of us are kind of like related. Um, it was also like, it felt like it was some fake cultural stuff because again, right, there was Honduran Mafia Crip, right? So it was like, a lot of people felt like, you know, it was like an offshoot, like, you know, whatever. Like, it just felt like more familiar, like like a family thing. And then, so when I moved uptown, at some point I stopped hanging out. I stopped going back and forth. It, it just it just took a little toll of just going back and forth and hanging Bronx and keep coming back to the Northeast Bronx. So eventually I just, you know, I made a lot of friends uptown. I became cool with some people. And then I realized there was a crip set around where I lived, but the area was still predominantly blood. So I lived, I lived in some blood housing projects. So, which was like Gun Hill projects. So I lived in some blood housing projects and it was like the whole neighborhood was like surrounded by blood. And as I grew up, like, cool with each other everybody was cool a lot of people wasn't really like you know everybody in my age bracket was cool it wasn't really into gang but then once we got to high school i felt like people started picking sides like people started either turning blood or they started turning crip but then there also was like the in-between gangs that might have had alliances with either bloods or crips and most most little gangs had alliances with bloods because they didn't want to really go against the bloods so i started to notice there was there was a lot of like stuff going on because my neighborhood was flooded with them and it was it, on, predominantly on Halloween they used to have this thing where like bloods used to go out and cut women like they used to they, I don't know if that was like a part of an initiation thing I don't I don't really know what was going on but I know for like some period of time like this was going on like even my mother used to be afraid to be out on Halloween oh, wow. um I even recall times where like my brother like my some of my friend's sisters used to tell us to go pick them up at the train station or go get them like from, from school or from work 
kids used to be let out early on Halloween because they knew like the bloods was out there, you know? Um, and if you even look at the comments on that video, everybody's talking about that, right? Like I remember those times, like even here, people talking from different states that they remember that. So that was kind of like some of the things that were going on, like, like robbing neutral people and not saying that Crips might not have been doing this. I'm just saying like, because there was so many bloods, it was like kind of like more noticeable, I guess. So that's kind of like the things that was going on, like neutral people getting beat up, like neutral people getting robbed, like, you know, a lot of like stuff that I, it just didn't really make sense to me. And that kind of like, at the time, it kind of like, I developed like some kind of like hatred for them. She said she want to see the city bus She don't want to ride the city bus Because she's new to the town I advise, look for truth The ears are lost in the sound Brains are lost in the cloud Dead from all of the smoke That's the reason why the ostrich hides his head in the ground That's the reason why the monster even puts on a mask And we turn the city green to blend in with the grass the This city is Big Flame Hope And you're tuning in to Dusty Vision TV just give me a little bit of peace a Steady job and some food to eat Just give me a little bit of peace a Steady job and some food to eat Just give me a little bit of peace Take me back to the day where you, you know, officially got put on Or as you call it, loped on, right? Yeah, 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 loped in, loped, loped in, in loped. Sorry <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's good, it's good um, So, I remember like this was like kind of like the monster, right? And then like, you know, I used to like come to, I so my middle school used to be across the street from the park of, of, um, it used to be across the street from the park where the Crips. So, you know, like I, so, you know, playing basketball there, I, I started to be around them. I started to like, you know, be cool with some of them, but they was way older than me. So they wasn't really like in my, in my age bracket of friends. So they wasn't really my friends. Like I used to just see them. And I remember, um, I remember one day, I remember one day in particular, I remember we was in the park, I was playing basketball and I remember it was like four Crips in the back, maybe like six, it was like six Crips in the back the park where they used to chill at. And I remember like, so, so in my neighborhood you had like 216, which was like considered like the Crip area. Um, and then you have like two, which was also considered like the blood park, right? So, and that's like, that's like a nine block radius. So I remember one day I was playing basketball and then like a bunch of dudes came from 225th. It had to be like around 50 of them. It had to be like between 50 to like maybe 60 people. And I know it sounds crazy or exaggeration, but like it literally, and the park only has two entrances. So it has a ramp entrance and it has a stair entrance. And then like, there's no other like exit I grew unless in, you have to. I grew up in LA and East Long Beach. So that does not sound like a stretch. I believe you 100% homie. <laughs> so the park only got two. The, the, the park only has two entrances and two entrances are like on, on, on one side of the street. And then that's the only way you could get out unless you hop the gate in the back. Right. Mm, <laughs> so, 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 all of these people came in from both entrances. So it's not even like they just came in from one entrance. They came in from both the entrances. So it's a bunch of them coming in and I'm sitting in the park like, oh snap, like it's about to get crazy, right? So I'm sitting there. Park was like a dangerous block because you know, they had to put on because they were surrounded by, by the enemy, right? Mm -hmm. So, so you know, they had guts coming over here. They, they came over here like old, like, you know, like 60 deep. So. I was on the park playing basketball and I'm just watching it. Right. And I watch how these dudes let them get close. Like almost, they got almost close to like the part of the back where they was hanging out at. And then I don't know, but like, I just heard them just like bucking shots. Mm. <laughs> right. So these dudes just started landing those shots. And I swear to God, it was like a big ass stampede in that part because all them people was trying to get out them exits Damn. that they came in. <laughs> and it was crazy. And from that day on, I was just like, Oh shit. Like, this, this should look like something, you know what I'm saying? Like, I already had, like, that, that hatred I was developing. And then, like, seeing them, like, hold their ground, like, them six crypt dudes and people, like, I was just like, oh, shit. Like, I was just like, well, what's this about? You know, on three. And then, like, 
as I started developing like my resistance, whatever. So one day I went to the park and you know, they always used to ask me like, yo, when you're going to turn crypt, like they used to say that to a lot of people that used to be in the park frequently that were neutral. That's just cause you was around. They'd be like, when you're going to turn crypt. And then people used to be like, nah, nah, you know, that's not for me. I play ball or whatever, whatever. But they always used to like throw it around, like joking around, maybe half serious. And then one day I was just like, you know, I felt like I was fed up and I was just like, you know what? Like, fuck it. And they looked at me like, it's almost like they were shocked. And this is how you kind of like, know they was kind of like half ass serious, half ass not really serious. Cause I was just like, all right, what up? Let's go. And they was looking at me like, you lying. I'm like, I'm dead serious. Like, let's go. Like, like, come on. Like, we going to do this. Like, you know, like they gave me like four guys. Actually, I, th- I think they only gave me four guys because there was only four guys in the park that day. Mm. So, oh, um, they gave, they gave me like four guys and, you know, I went in there and, you know, I, I watch other situations when they loke other people in. So I already knew that, you know, sometimes they do you dirty and, and, you know, they, they catch you off guard or, or when you least expect it. So I was already prepared. And I was the one that set it off. And then, you know, I fought for like 60 seconds, a minute. And then after that, like, and I didn't really fall. I didn't even really fall. So that was good. And I fought back. So, and then after that, you know, it, it, it was lit, you know, they, they embraced me. And then we, you know, I, I went home to, you know, to treat my body aches. <laughs> Damn. And that was it. All right. Um, so let's fast forward a little bit, or maybe it was right around the same time, because I know you did do uh, some time behind bars. Uh, you did jail and prison time, correct? Yeah, yeah. You go to jail county first, and then if you get convicted, you go to state okay. prison. And and sorry, because I'm out in L.A., so I, I'm still kind of confused on, on the whole situation out there. So would Rikers be considered county jail? or? Yes. Okay. So cool. Rikers Island, yeah, Rikers Island is county jail. Um, they used to have, like, they used to have jails in, in individual boroughs, but some of them closed down. Um, some of them, some of them were still kind of like, was yeah, a lot of them closed down and there was maybe like a boat. There's a boat that's a jail in the Bronx. And then, yeah, that was the only one that was open at the time when I got, and then there was one in Manhattan and then, but Rikers is like, and everybody over there. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay, cool. Yeah. This is where I want to jump into because I got a chance to check out a couple of your videos uh, on this particular subject as well. Um, I guess first off, um, what got you sent to Rikers? Um, so why I went to Rikers, it was um, for the for a shooting that 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 took mm. in the street life, gang life, and then um, there was a situation that transpired. With it. Allegedly, they said that there was an individual that I was cool with that he had told on my friend another individual that I was cool with, and I happened to have given the firearm to the end of that ended up telling suppose allegedly, right. Mm. Isn't there at the precinct, but this is, this is what it, this, I gave this dude the gun one night. They walked down the block, got locked up and the individual I gave the gun to, he tossed the gun. The story is that he tossed, but anyway, they ended up getting locked up. My other friend said that this individual had told, that's the game. The stories just didn't add up. It didn't make sense to me. You know, like what, what, what the other individual was. I took it like if it was the truth because I know I gave him the firearm and I didn't understand how my friend that I didn't give the firearm to got hit with the gun charge. Mm. So when my friend is telling me at the precinct, he said that it was his firearm. It makes sense because he's the only one that's hit with the firearm. And they, and, and, and from what I heard, they found the, the police found the gun on the floor. So you're supposed to be processed with that firearm also if they found the gun on the floor until the fingerprints come back. Uh, so the fact that he was never, he was never processed with the arrest of the firearm was already fishy. Uh-huh. You know, so some people were trying to say there was no paperwork. And I was trying to say like, what paperwork are they going to have at that moment? Like you are, are, are in the park sitting down and they found a gun in the trash can and I say, it's your gun. The police, the police, won't, they could just take that and lock you up and process the arrest. They don't care. So that's something that, that happens out here a lot. So that was kind of like the situation. And, and then that led to like a shooting um, because like this individual was, you know, he was, he was a dangerous individual and there was like some threats that was, that was being put up there. And, you know, individuals showed up to my house 
And, you know, I, I didn't take no chances at the end of the day. Like, at the end of the day, like, there was there was this alleged allegation. Um, the story sounded funny. And then there was, like, some threats that I heard that the individual was trying to, like, you know, when somebody says you're a rat and it's like, if it's the truth, even if it's not the truth, a way you're trying to, like, cover that or, or handle that is, like, I'm going to make an example out of the person that's saying I'm a rat so that people don't, don't, don't believe I'm a rat, you know? So that was kind of, like, the situation. And this individual basically was like, he was going to deal with me. So I kind of like felt like I have to do it, you know? So that's really what happened. Also, not just that, but also the fact that like, if you snitch in the street, you, you already know what that comes with, mm -hmm. you know? So that was kind of like, you know, street codes that I was living by. The, so like in the, in the moment and in the time, it just, it was something that had to be done. This is Vic Slane Hope, and you're tuning in to Dusty Vision TV. Just give me a little bit of peace, a steady job and some food to eat. Just give me a little bit of peace, a steady job and some food to eat. Just give me a little bit of peace. And New York is a, for lack of better phrases, is a mostly blood state. That's safe to say. Yeah, definitely. Right? Okay. Um, yeah, definitely. So, yeah, I do. I want to know your experience um, entering, you know, as a Crip in, in, in Rikers. Talk to me. Yeah, so when I first got locked up, it was just like, at first, I didn't really, you know, the, the shooting happened. I was still out in the streets. And then, like, about two, three days later, the police showed up. So I never, I never, I didn't know if this was, was going to live um, because, you know, he got shot in the face. So I didn't know if he was going to live. Um, but when he did live, I didn't expect him to tell on me. Like, I didn't think he was going to tell. Even though, like, allegedly, they say he told on my friend. Like, I viewed him as, like, you know, this dude is is a, is, is a gangster, right? He, like, he's some straight up, like, you know, I, I know about this dude. So I didn't think he was going to tell. But then when he did tell, I was kind of, like, shocked. Like, like the funny thing is I, I knew I would do prison time, but I never knew that it would be because somebody would tell on me, like, especially somebody that, you know, I never thought I was going to get into beef with my own gang. So anyway, when I went to Rikers out, my head was up, you know, like I was just like, damn, like, okay. like the I'm, person you shot, sorry huh? to rewind, but the person you, or the situation was with another crip, correct? Yes, definitely. Gotcha. Okay, cool, cool. So you go into prison and you're, you're beefing with your own sect at this time, right? Yes. So gotcha. at this time I'm in, I'm beefing with my own sect. So, be, and before I got locked up, people from my had called me, threatening me. They called me and said, yo, it's not safe for you and your mom. Damn. Like, um, so it got real. Like, they told me, like, yo, it's not for you and your mom. Like, you know, like, you, you wowed out. Because they had a different story. Like, the story that they had was, like, that I shot this dude over a dirt bike or wow. or some other flimsy shit that they made up. Because he was, he was, he was that's an OG in the set. Mm. So people looked up to him. Mm. And... And and at the end of the day, like I mentioned before, I was the youngest dude in my set to turn Crip when I when I became Crip. So everybody else was older than me. They grew up together and they was buddy buddies. I was some random dude. The higher ups didn't really know me, so everybody sided with him and took his word when the situation happened. Nobody cared what I had to say. They was just like, "Homie, you was wrong, they were, and we are gonna kill you." So. So it was, it was, it was a crazy situation. Now I'm in jail. And so now I'm conflicted, right? Because it's like, I got beef with my own set <laughs> and I'm a crip and I'm going to have beef with bloods. So, um, so when I, when I first went to the house, the first house that I went to the intake house, my one, there was a bunch of crips there when I got there. So, you know, it's crazy because you know, when you're in the streets, you only hear the stories like, yo, it's mad bloods in jail. Crips don't live in jail. So that, this is like things that are in my mind too. Right. But when I get to my one, there's a whole bunch of Crips there from Brooklyn. So, so what I experienced in jail, like the toughest Crips in jails come from Brooklyn and the Bronx. You know, this is just what I experienced. Not saying that there's not tough Crips from Queens or Manhattan and Harlem. What I experienced is a, is a high influx of, of tougher Crips from the Bronx and Brooklyn. So it was a, there was a bunch of dudes from Brooklyn. There was from the, from, 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 from the nineties and the hundred, hundred clocks. So, you know, um, there was a bunch of them. There was G Stone at the time. So, and there was like a few others from the Bronx. And then I ran into my man from the Bronx, you know, um, shout outs to Twin, Twin Lope, um, Rock Gang. So, um, I ran into him and I told him about my situation. I had met him in the street and I was like, yo, bro, I'm conflicted right now. I don't even know if I should claim my, my set because it's like, I, I got beef with them. 
So I'm like, they, they want my head. So I don't even know if I should like, to them, I was in crypt. So anyway, he told me, look, bro, at the end of the day, if it's in your heart, it's in your heart, bro. Like, like, you know what I'm saying? Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, so you decide what it's going to be, what it is. So I was like, all right, man. From then on, when I left that house and I went to the other house, when I pulled up to the other house, like, people ask you, before, well, if you've if you seen my story, like, when I got to the house, like, they couldn't impress me because they had a certain CEO that they didn't let them do it. Mm-hmm. But at night when I was on the phone, um, there was two homeboys in the house. There was G-Stone, too. So they heard me speaking in crypt codes on the phone. And then, you know, one of them approached me. He was like, oh, you crypt? He was like, oh, all right, what's cracking? Like, we was talking. He was like, yo, it was me and another homeboy in the house. So it was kind of like a, a, a fake smooth. Um, and so I didn't really. But, yeah, like, sometimes I just be thinking about it. And I'd be like, yo, God, like, had to, like, be me. And he was just kind of like. Because I hear other stories about other people. They didn't. And even. Even like the same day I got moved, I got moved with another crib, but they put him in the other side of the house and he got smoked Damn. as soon as he got there. My transition was a little smooth, even to the house that I went to because there was two other crips there. And I was, I'm, I'm just a dude that's going to hold my own, you know? And I think also the way the house was run, did it didn't facilitate for me to get smoked like maybe in other houses because of higher classification and different things like that. But that's, that was like the beginning of adolescence. And it was just like, but I didn't really get into nothing crazy. Um, I had a few fights and some, a lot of them wasn't really related to like gang stuff. It was just about like somebody trying to disrespect you and stuff like that. Okay. You have a video titled the difference between banging in behind bars and banging in the streets or something along the banging in the slammer and banging in the streets. Um, what, what are some of those differences? Um, so some of those differences is like, for example, in the street, you could be cool with a blood in the street. Like one of my mans was blood. You know, he was cool. He used to be in the crib with us. We used to um, smoke. We used to drink. We used to chill, you know, talk to girls like we was cool. Um, but then it's like when you go to when you go to jail, it's kind of like jail is different. Right. Because it's like somebody has the jail. Sometimes like when you pull up to a building, a certain building there's a person that has the building, right? Like whoever's the highest rank in blood here or whoever's the highest rank in crip. So what happens sometimes if you had an alliance, or, I mean, not an alliance or a friendship with somebody that was blood, me being crip, that's, that's, that's gone when you get to jail. In adolescence, it might still rock because we adolescents and the adolescents feel like they do whatever they want. Like no old head going to tell me nothing. And plus it's our world. Right? Like adolescent world is our world. But then when you leave adolescence and you go to adults, the adults is not going to play with you. Like, they're going to get you up out of there. They're going to cut you. Either you're going to eat, you're going to be fooled. So, you know, like, so that's what happens. Like, when you're in the street, you could be cool, but your buddy and your OG might not really feel no, you know what you're really doing. You know, the jail is like, it's an enclosed place. Everybody know what you're doing, who you're fraternizing with, who you eating with, who you cooking with, who you who you're associating with. And then a lot of times they make you pick us. They make, they'll tell you like, you can't live with that dude or you would stop cooking with that dude. Stop talking to that dude. Or and a lot of times they might tell you to tell him to cut me, you know, or, or tell, you know, so, so that's usually like the, the some of the differences that, and, and it doesn't matter who, who you really under in the street, who, who he know, or who you know, it's usually like who got the building, who got the house. You better move accordingly. Just give me a little bit of peace Steady job and some food to eat Just give me a little bit of peace Steady job and some food to eat Just give me a little bit of peace Steady job and some food to eat This is Vic Slain Hope and you're tuning in to Dusty Vision TV Just give me a little bit of peace Steady job and some food to eat just give me a little bit of peace a Steady job and some food to eat Just give me a little bit of peace You, and before I ask you this question, I want to encourage you to keep doing videos like this. They're not going to get the most views because I try it on my channel also, trust me. Um, like we talked about earlier, the negative or the the perceived negative seems to get better um, uh, views than the positive. But uh, just today, 
you, a couple hours ago, you released a video. Um, and right now in L.A., it's a war zone, dog. Um, I grew up in the 90s in L.A., so I remember when we, we had upwards of 2,500 murders in one year back in uh, two, 1993, which led to the 94 crime bill that President Biden passed. And that's a whole other story. Um, but I know New York is experiencing a similar uptick. Um, just to give you an idea, recently we had 68 shootings that have been recorded in L.A. City, along with 20, 24 of those being homicides. We are we're going we're going backwards here. And um, I, from what I watched, I watched the video that you did earlier, and it sounds like you guys are experiencing the same thing. And my question is, well, and this is something that I've been pumping since day in one. Excuse my language, but where is the outrage? Where is the outrage that little black babies and little Latino babies are being, sh we're be they're being killed by stray bullets, future doctors, lawyers, and it's just crazy, man. But I want everybody out there to know that his channel is not just about, you know, him talking about his life, but he's also pushing, you know, some real shit that we need to talk about in the black community. So can you just touch on that a little bit? Um, that video, where's the outrage that you did today? Yeah, um, so it's actually an old video that oh, I have posted is. on Instagram. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's an old video um, on Instagram, but nevertheless there is there has been shootings the shootings is up me and one of like the the homeboys was just talking about this, this young brother that follows me um shout out to felly gat he's talking about this and he was just saying like he feels like it's the music the drill music mm -hmm. so talk new, so so new york got like this you know new york started making drill music smoking right? such and such pack and yeah mm -hmm. yeah you know, so New York started making this drill music, you know, Pop Smoke and, and, and Fabio uh, and like, you know, all this stuff going on with the woos and the chos and the and this Brooklyn sound, right? Like it's like this Brooklyn wave gonna make drill music and it's just going crazy, right? Like this is the crazy thing, because even in London, London had like some little stabbing speed. Yeah, yeah. And they've been making grimes and drill music out there, right? Mm -hmm. So so it's like it's some truth in what he's saying about the music, right? Like, it's like, it's like drill music. It's like, yo, it's about going to get your ops, going to do this. But I think that, I think it's also like pandemic stuff related. I think that like poverty is always like a byproduct of like violence. Yeah. Well, I think like with all this stuff going on, people like. People are hungry. Yep. People are hungry. People are angry. People are upset. People are frustrated. Um, people are scamming. Scamming is up. Oh man! So I, I think scams through the roof. <laughs> you know, so so I think with scamming, um, um, it's bringing an influx of, of money. So people are buying guns. You know, people they they strapping up like crazy. Um, and it's also like you know. So I think it's it's all of these things are catalysts. Um, about what's going on, but I just feel like, yeah, I feel like people, like I just think we need to be courageous. I think. I'm gonna stay out the way. Uh, like I think, like, like Huey P. Newman said this right. He said, "Either you have reactionary suicide, which means like you see a condition that is going on, and you're just gonna like wait for it to kill you, mm. or you either gonna be in the revolutionary source, uh, try to change it, and if death does come and falls upon you, at least." you took a shot at trying to change the conditions, yeah, right? I love that. And I think that that's some of the things that a lot of people are afraid to do. I think a lot of like, and that's why I call on the real G's and, and the people that are are willing to take this risk, right? Because I believe a lot of people are not going to go without, they're not going to go away quietly, right? I think that if, if we have this idea, Gonna change the hood, and it's not gonna be no blush yet. That nobody gonna like stand up to it. And nobody gonna be like, get up out of here. Um, I think that we got something else coming, and it's sad that it has to be that way. But I, I probably also think that the cops. I feel like the cops are being lackadaisical right now because people have been talking about defund the police, and I feel like they're doing this as ploy. I agree. To 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 kind of like show you like 100%. I told you so you know so so the cops is kind of like chilling right now the detectives haven't like really been out there wilding like they usually do um so they're trying to say you see and y'all want to and y'all want to defund the police and y'all look at this so so I feel like they're doing that and and you know another thing 
This is what police do. The police also know they who kill who, but sometimes they let the murders rack up so they could just come and do like big indictments. This is what they do in New York. I don't know if they do this in California, but in New York, they, they might watch, they might know who kills such and such. They wait for you to retaliate. They'll let this go on for like five years, mm. five to seven years. And then they will come in. They did this in my neighborhood uptown, right? Mm. Um, when I came home in 2016, they, they wrapped up 120 dudes and they said they've been, they was watching them since 2007. Mm. So in 2016, they wrapped up 120 dudes and you knew who, who was responsible for it. And they just watched shit play out. And then all them years later, they just came back and snatched up a whole generation between 18 to 25, mm. you know? So yeah, all of those things are the byproducts of this. Yeah. Yeah. And we just need to get a little more angry about that is what I'm saying. Yes. We, 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 we get we angry do. when the, the cops kill us. Yes. And we have a right to be angry. Yes, I get it. But why the, why are we not angry when little babies are dying? Dog, a little baby was killed like not, two blocks from where I'm sitting right now. A little girl just in the middle of gang violence. And it just really sucks, man. Yeah, and I think um, I also have a, I had a video about suggestions. I had a live video that I made about suggestions, and I'm like, we need a new code of conduct. Like, this is not, like, and I'm saying, like, yes, I did live by the no snitching code, and, you know what I'm saying, if you're playing the game, I do not endorse in all type of way that when you get caught up playing the game that you give somebody else up because you want to go free. But I also I also have a video on um, the difference between a snitch and a, and a good Samaritan. A so... You know, so I'm also saying, like, we need a new code of conduct in the hood because all of this, like, no accountability, like somebody could just kill a little girl and kill a little boy and kill the old lady in her house and, and do all these crazy things. And there's no accountability. But then we still want to say free him. Mm -hmm. Like, that shit is some bullshit. Mm -hmm. Like, that shit is like the dumbest shit that I ever heard. And if you would do that or a woman or anybody that is endorsing that and for that, then use a fool too. Like you part of the problem too, mm -hmm. you know? So I think we just need some revolutionary action and, and, and we need to value ourselves. Like the same way we get upset when our cops do it. Like we need to be upset. Like, yo bro, like you just some stupid shit, bro. Mm -hmm. Like that shit is like motherfuckers shouldn't even be like gang bangers should be like, yo, you're not even crip no more after and that. So you're not even blood no more yes, after yeah. that. You're not like, like this, this, this needs to be something that's implemented. We need a new code of conduct, and and that's this is the the kind of things and conversation that I be trying to push. One of the best things I've ever heard on my program. I appreciate that, dog. That's so true. This is Vic Slang Hope, and you're tuning in to Dusty Vision TV. Just give me a little bit of peace, steady job and some food to eat. Just give me a little bit of peace, steady job and some food to eat. Just give me a little bit of peace. We are. I always try to try to leave my my uh, show with a positive message. You know, my show is not about glorifying gangs, but it's about you know that. 13 year old right now who may be listening and he has his tiptoe in the street and he's like yes those crips across the street look cool let me go do you know i want them to listen to cats like you and other people i have on my show and, and i want them to think is this something that i really really want um with that being said um you have a video that i found interesting i didn't watch the whole thing because i wanted to you know leave it up to you to you know end the show with it but you have a video um titled what they didn't tell you about the gang life and one of the first things you, I think you started with was, you know, how when you're locked up, the homies ain't coming to visit you. Um, can, can you kind of, you know, just, just talk to some kids out there who, who may be going down the route that you did and, and tell them what they don't know about the gang life? Yeah, um, that, was, that was like one of like, I feel like that was one of the deepest videos that I made. And yeah, like, I think I just, I just want to let them know that I know sometimes we be looking at, cause I was there, I was right there and I know you hear it all the time from older people, but like the fact is that like, you know, they paint this beautiful picture and I know like in a moment you feeling like I'm invincible, I'm on top of the world, I'm young, you mad, you old, you know, I'm smarter, you know, we're different, you know, I'm, uh, I'm you know, like, like, you know, people be thinking like they slick, right? Like I thought I was slick when I was younger and older people try to tell me things and I didn't listen. I didn't listen and I didn't listen. And I feel like it's a cycle. Like the next, the next generation does the same, right? right? You're old head, you washed up, like get out of here. Like, and then it just keeps going. So I just want to let them know, man, that, you know, like why you might be out there right now 
And while you might be smoking with them and everything is cool and you think your man's is different than my man's and, and, and they're going to hold it down and they're going to do different things. It's like you never, one thing I realized, you never really fully know who you are till you get into a situation. You never really know who your team is, needs from them. When you're in the street, you kind of like can move around, move about. Everybody's you could kind of like, everybody's winning, you, you know. In a lot of my videos, I don't talk about my wins. I don't talk about what I did to people. I don't talk about, you know, because it's not about glorifying. I'm telling you my losses. Yeah. <laughs> I'm telling you because, because I want to get that message. Like, it's a lot of losses with this. It's a lot of losses with this. And when you go to prison, you feel it the most. Most of the time, only your mother is going to be there. Most of the time. And then at some point, you, you're going to wish that somebody else was there. You're going to wish you had a girl or something. You're going to wish that them same dudes you was riding with send you money, send you packages, come visit you, you know, and changes. And they, they might remember you for the first few weeks, the first month, and they might be saying, free him, free him, free him. And that's about it. Yep. That's about it. You don't, you don't give your life up. You, you don't. And, and the most important people that you gave your life up on is your family. Mm. Because, and, and you know, if, if anybody that I am sorry to is to my mother, mm. because I left her, I didn't listen to her. And I think the main thing I want to, if you don't get nothing from this message, I'm telling you right now, be knowing. <laughs> you think your mother don't know. My mother used to always tell me, don't hang out with them dudes, man. And I used to tell her, mom, you don't even know them. You just talking. You don't even know them. We you know. just you just saying stuff. You just chatting. And you know what? Everything she said to me, she was right. Damn. She she was right. She always told me, "Don't hang out with them, dude. Why? You, what you doing with them, dude? Them, you think them dudes your friends?" Mm. And she didn't even know them. And mom, you know, it's something about a woman's intuition. Not all the time, because you know some sisters be you know being their head too much. But you know something about a mother's intuition, right? When she tells you something, like mothers just be knowing. They just be stealing things. They feel when their children are in danger. They feel like, it's sometimes that my mom told me, yo, be extra careful. Like when I talk to her, mm -hmm. she'll be like, be extra careful. I wonder, like, damn, why is she telling me that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, like, and it's like almost like she feels something. And so, you know, if anything, I would say, man, like, cherish your mom. And like, be there for your family. Ba like, bang for your family, because your family needs you. You might be... You might be the, 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 the son that the family is looking up to. You might be the one that might help your family out of poverty or, or help them get somewhere, you know? Like, I think about all these artists that die. Like, God gave you a chance to make money and generational wealth and get your family out of a situation, and you out here screaming, gang. Yep. And, you, and you out here still banging. And I'm not saying you got to stop banging, but I'm just saying, like, you can't be doing the same shit. Like, we see the Casanovas, we see the King Vaughns, we RP, we see the, like, all these people that we don't lost, either to the jails or death, because they feel like they still got to, like, hold on to that, or they, or they still got to be in the hood, or they still got to be doing these things. And I just feel like, yo, think about your family, man. Think about the, the collateral damage that you're doing to your family. Not just when you go to jail, but also think about who you might kill, who you might remove from their home. Like, people got children. That might have been the only person helping his mother out or his grandmother out, and you just took him from the household. Mm. You know, so so this is how, you know, we got to think about the collapse. And listen to your mom, cherish your mom, love your mom. Man. You no. Know? That's That was probably the best way to end the show, man. I really appreciate you sharing your story. And one more time, please tell everyone where they can find you on YouTube. And if you have anything else you want to promote, the floor is yours. Um, so you can find me, my YouTube is Vic Slang Hope. You know, I always say Vic Slang Hope, not dope. <laughs> yeah. But you know, we got it. We got a Slang Hope. And it's about, I think a lot of people in our communities are hopeless and they don't have nothing forward to look to. And I think like that's how catalyst that these, these, these brothers use that were misguided and hoodwinked. Um, to their advantage because they know like these kids are hopeless and these kids don't see nothing else but murder and mayhem. And I think that if we was to create more hope, if we was to have like different role models and show like a different path, I think like, you know, we kind of like, but this is what we up against, you know, we up against ignorance, but that's, that's my YouTube channel. My IG is baby lane. Oh, two. So this is like places you could contact me. You could reach me. If you need advice, like I don't be charging people for advice. I think like, 
God has gave me a platform. You know, like you mentioned, like it's hard to get to 10K. I don't really, I, I got to 10K in like two months, to be honest. You know, at the beginning of November, I had 163 subscribers. That's dope. In November alone, in November alone, I got 5,300 subscribers. That tells you something, dog. That tells you. You know, two months. That's dope, dog. It took me a year to get to 1,000 subscribers. <laughs> yeah, so, and the sad thing is that I, I mainly got to those subscribers by talking about jail. And it, and that's sad. It just shows you mm-hmm. the state of, of what we're going through and where we're at. Like, it's sad that I had to I had to make content about jail. I know it's intriguing, but I'm like, damn. Like, if I never made jail content or these story times, like, I would still be back. I'd probably be at 200 right now. Mm, yeah. You know, Um. but, you know, it, it's, it's a method to my madness and how I get my message across. So, thank you for having me on the show. I appreciate it. Yeah, thank and, you. Thank well, you for dropping that positivity. Word. Because I see that's what you're doing. You, you, you're, you know, like I said, you're disguising, you know, the jail stuff, but you're dropping some gems in there, dog. I, I, I see what you're up to, homie. I see what you're up to, and that's dope. Yeah, as definitely. Hell. That's dope as hell, man.